You've never read an existential breakdown quite like The Pigeon. Better than food, man. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Welcome to it. Good to see you guys. The Pigeon is a short novel living in the deceptively pleasant, magical realism world of Kafka or Gabriel Garcia Marquez, punctuated with this creeping spider of self-loathing neuroticism a la Clarice Lispector or maybe Thomas Bernhardt. It wears a clever mask. The polite tone and the benign cover completely disguise the chaos therein. Something small in our lives can trigger something enormous. We all know this. I'm sure plenty of you have come close to a mental breakdown. Some of you may actually have experienced one. I don't think I have, but I think I've come pretty close. Maybe some of you actually struggle with mental illness. I'm sure some of you will someday. Maybe I will too. I hope you don't, and I hope I don't either. What if you found yourself so exhausted by all of it that one seemingly insignificant thing just threw you over the edge? And that one thing that threw you into the chasm, into the pit, that dropped your ass in the abyss of chaos was a pigeon. This is a book from my very good friend and mentor, Jay, who is a very kind supporter of the show now. And she's been trying to get me to read it for years, and I've been putting it off and putting it off. And I'll be honest, for no good reason, uh, though now that I've finally read it, that I've finally gotten around to it, it seems like the perfect time. It seems like fate. Being surrounded by this, being surrounded by all of this madness daily in Los Angeles. This was the perfect time and place in my life in the world. I could I loved it. It was fantastic. Better than food. You can finish it in a day, in an afternoon. Like two hours. The style is subdued, it's simple, it's concise, shifting in and out of the main protagonist's thoughts, but always maintaining its frame of subtle but total anxious dread. It's less than a hundred pages and written by the same guy who wrote Perfume, a book I have not finished yet, but I've started and I can already tell it's superb. Recommended countless times on this channel. Patrick Zuskind is a German author who does not give interviews. Not many pictures of him either. There isn't a lot of information on him. He seems to be a playwright, a novelist, and a recluse. On a short Wikipedia article, I read that he splits his time between Munich and Montelieu. Montelieu is very interesting. I had never heard of it. It's a small French village in the south with a population uh, of about 800. It has 15 bookstores. It's essentially a town of book lovers built by book lovers. This is the first time I've heard of it. I'm amazed. They call it the Village de Livre, the town of books. I gotta go. If anyone has been there, tell me about it. I'd love to visit. It's on the list. If you're gonna be a reclusive author living in France, that seems like the place to do it. But back to the book. From the very first page, we're given a streamlined introduction to Jonathan Noel, a timid Parisian bank security guard. At the time, the pigeon affair overtook him, unhinging his life from one day to the next. Jonathan Noel, already past 50, could look back over a good 20-year period of total uneventfulness and would never have expected anything of importance could ever overtake him again, other than death, someday. And that was perfectly all right with him. For he was not fond of events and hated outright those that rattled his inner equilibrium and made a muddle of the external arrangements of life. What little obsessive stability Jonathan possesses in life is destroyed by discovering a pigeon in his building. This outrage, this disruption of order and harmony is the last straw in his life. It had been built up to for his lifetime. And finally, his insecurities boil into a frothing storm of malaise and panic. He's generally distrustful of people. As we find out, he's been betrayed by the one he loved after she left him for a Tunisian grocer. He doesn't seem to trust anyone, including himself. You wonder about men and women that you meet on the street or those that you go to school or work with. Just how many of them are close to the breaking point? It's difficult to say. It's obvious here in downtown Los Angeles where people are like screaming and you're like, ah, crazy, you know, it's, <laughs> you can, but people can hide it pretty well. Uh, the barista who's serving you your coffee might be like this close to just snapping. This story is many things, but for me, what's very interesting is it's an exploration of the fear of a wasted life. Of the creeping regret that comes when you discover that you've been a coward in your own eyes. When you get that vicious 2020 hindsight. 
when you had the opportunity to do what you truly wanted to do, and then you didn't. You didn't let yourself. You missed your chance. And it's your fault. It's our biggest fear. Regret. Personally, for me, I think regret is a bigger fear than death. And that's probably the case for many people. The idea that one day I will finally be able to recognize where I truly destroyed my own chances at realizing whatever desires I have or had uh, is a nightmare. It's terrifying because I would be the only one to blame. You have to take that responsibility. And while it's good to think about this when you're young, as it kind of contains this catalytic spur of fearful, nervous energy that can be really productive and awesome, we will all get to the age when we have no more chances left. Well, you know, some of us might die before that and unknowingly, so no big deal. But many of us, you know, we will get to the age when we have no more chances left, where we will likely be unable to recover from the big failures. Which is fine, and it's something that we're all talking about and thinking about all the time, but we have to, you know, you gotta keep that in mind and you, you can't be afraid of it. The idea for me is to check in constantly, to ask, am I moving towards what I truly want, towards what is actually meaningful or desirable to me, and is in line with my overall life trajectory. I know that sounds a little, you know, you can get into just like some woo-woo shit there, but you know, really. I mean, it's important to check in, like, <laughs> every week, if not every day, Life is short, it's the truth. It goes by fast. It doesn't take long at all. Suddenly you're 45 doing something for a living that you hate living with people whom you thought you loved but turned out to be complete strangers. Or one day you discover a pigeon inside your building and chaos ensues. Jonathan has somehow kept chaos at bay throughout his life. Not today. It has crossed the threshold and wrapped itself around his mind. He can't escape the pigeon. He had almost set foot across the threshold, had already raised the foot, his left, his leg was in the act of stepping when he saw it. It was sitting before his door, not eight inches from the threshold, in the pale reflection of dawn that came through the window. It was crouched there with red, taloned feet on the oxblood tiles of the hall and in sleek, blue-gray plumage, the pigeon. It had laid its head to one side and was glaring at Jonathan with its left eye. This eye, a small, circular disk, brown with a black center, was dreadful to behold. It was like a button soon onto the feathers of the head, lashless, browless, quite naked, turned quite shamelessly to the world and monstrously open. At the same time, however, there was something guarded and devious in that eye, and yet, likewise, it seemed to be neither open nor guarded, but rather quite simply lifeless, like the lens of a camera that swallows all external light and allows nothing to shine back out of its interior. No luster, no shimmer lay in that eye, not a sparkle of anything alive. It was an eye without sight, and it glared at Jonathan. The audiobook of this needs to be read by Werner Herzog. But rather quite simply lifeless, like the lens of a camera that swallows all external light and allows nothing to shine back out of its interior. That's what Herzog said. He said something about, you know, the lens of a camera that I'm staring at right now, being something like, you know, staring into death. Death is like a camera or a pigeon. <laughs> Many of us can relate to spending far more time than we'd care to in a dead-end relationship or job, frightened to make a move and risk jeopardizing our foundation, when that is secretly and unconsciously precisely what we desperately crave and need. He had once calculated that by the time of his retirement, he would have spent 75,000 hours standing on these three marble steps. He would then assuredly be the one person in all Paris, perhaps even all France, who had stood the longest time in just one place. And of course, within this developing solipsism, this devastating alienation and loneliness, there grows a hatred. This kind of contempt, unfortunately, is all too familiar for many of us. Where you're in such a state of mental suffering, even if it isn't necessarily physical, that you begin to truly despise your fellow man. And this odd superiority complex follows, resulting in outrageously callous judgments and a hypersensitivity to things that just don't matter. It takes on an infinitely disturbing quality when you realize that, again, many people feel or have felt this way. Their empathy is greatly diminished because when you have this type of mental suffering, it feels as if you are the only one who is suffering and has ever suffered. 
The self-loathing dammed up inside him and spilled over and gushed out, gushed out of glaring eyes that grew ever grimmer, angrier, beneath the brim of his cap, flooding the outside world as perfect, vulgar hate. Whatever came within his field of vision, Jonathan coated with the vile patina of his hate. Indeed, one could say that a real image of the world no longer passed the retina to enter the brain, but rather, in a reversal of the flow of light that his eyes hurled warped internal images into the outside world. The waiters, for instance, across the way, on the other side of the street, on the pavement in front of the cafe, those good-for-nothing young, stupid waiters who loitered among the tables and chairs, the louts, babbling and grinning and smirking and getting in the way of pedestrians and whistling after the girls, cock of the walk, and doing nothing except occasionally relaying a shouted order by bellowing it through the open doors to the bar. A coffee! A beer! A lemonade and lime! And then finally easing themselves inside to juggle the order back out with feigned haste and to serve it with pretentious, pseudo-artistic waiterly gestures. The cup twirled down under the table in a spiral, the coke bottle clamped between the thighs and opened with a flick of the wrist. The bill held between the lips spat first into one hand and then shoved under the ashtray while the other hand was already making change at the next table and scooping up piles of money. Astronomical prices, five francs for an espresso, 11 francs for a small beer, plus a surcharge of 15% for the foppish service, and an extra tip to boot. Yes, they expected that as well, fancy layabouts. Dandies, an extra tip. Otherwise, not so much as a thanks would pass their lips, not to mention a goodbye without that extra tip. Customers were thim... Customers were simply thin air from then on, and as they left the place saw nothing but arrogant waiters' backs and arrogant waiters' asses, above which the black overstuffed waiters' change purses were crammed into waste vans, for they considered that chic and nonchalant, the stupid Nancys, putting their change purses on display like fat bums. Oh, he could have bayoneted just with a look, those smug bastards in their loose, cool, short-sleeved waiters' shirts. He would have loved to run over and drag them out by the ear from under their shady awning and slap them right out in the street. Give them a left, a right, a left, a right. Whap, smack behind the ears and tan their backsides. And on and on and on and on. You ever have days like that? I have. I remember dark days like this when I was younger, feeling this way constantly. But any kind of shit you talk like this, and I will reiterate this over and over, is a mirror. It is simply a mirror held up to yourself. It's a cliche, I know, but it's true, absolutely 150%. So everything begins to take on this heightened quality in that state of anxiety that we all know and share. The smallest disturbances cause the biggest reactions. How can you solve problems like this? Well, you know, walking helps. Walking soothes. There is a healing power in walking. The regular placement of one foot in front of the other while at the same time rowing rhythmically with the arms, the rising rate of respiration, the slight stimulation of the pulse, the actions required of eye and ear for determining direction and maintaining balance, the feeling of the passing air brushing against the skin. All these are events that mass about the body and mind in a quite irresistible fashion and allow the soul, be it ever so atrophied and bruised, to grow and expand. It's a great description. So Jonathan reaches the logical conclusion and he decides that he's going to kill himself. Less, it seems, out of despair than out of total exhaustion. He's tired of his own neurosis. He's tired of himself. He's tired of seeing the same vagabond across the street from his work every day. A man who he is simultaneously jealous of and absolutely disgusted by. It's difficult to decipher what men like Jonathan have to live for except the fear of what's on the other side of death. I'll spoil it for you. He doesn't kill himself, but... I'll let you figure out why. It's not a spoiler, really. I mean, it's, you know. The book is about the process, this unfolding, this internal unfolding and breaking down and building up and, yeah. For such a short book, The Pigeon is tremendously impressive in its scope, perfectly conveying the experience of self-sabotage and internal existential conflict. Short, sweet, disturbing, and unexpectedly profound. The Pigeon by Patrick Ziskind. Better than food. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a bunch, Jay. I had this awesome conversation with a fan who stopped by for coffee the other day, and it inspired me to establish more of a dialogue with you guys because I, I love it. I love talking to fans of the show, you know, people who love books. I love having the back and forth and getting recommendations and just talking about ideas and, uh, it's awesome, you know. I'd love to have coffee with you guys all the time, but I know you're all spread out 
all over the world on different continents. So I've got this experiment. Just because you guys live in different states or countries doesn't mean we can't have coffee to talk about books. So on Patreon, depending on your donation and because I have limited time, unfortunately, I'm offering 20 minute to an hour long coffee Skype sessions to talk about books or ideas or you know, whatever. They start with a donation of 10 bucks to the channel, which is basically like the price of a coffee here in LA. Slight exaggeration, but probably not for long. It's pretty sad, yeah. And of course, the higher the donation, the more coffee conversations we have. I limit it to those who have donated on Patreon for a couple of reasons. One, because just like you, I'm super busy, and two, it acts as a safety filter for weirdos because at the end of the day, this is the internet. Okay, I think that's all I got for today. Are there any more updates? Uh, enjoying the pinch on. Yeah, you know, uh, crying a lot 49 wasn't really my cup of tea, but uh, reading Gravity's Rainbow, just, uh, you know, it's taken a long time, but uh, I'm just kinda, yeah, I'm, I, can see, uh, I can see the appeal. Sort of uh, meditative, just uh, falling in there. It's just sort of like drifting through uh, ideas. Ideas and circumstances and, and things and phrases. It's, uh, I don't know what the hell is going on, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's just kind of the approach that you're supposed to take with it. You're just kind of supposed to let it like wash over you and somewhere things start to kind of take a form like with the repetition and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the themes and I, and the, I don't know. Uh, there's so many characters though. But uh, we'll see. I'm enjoying it so far. Uh, so look forward to that. Look forward to that review. I also made a prototype for the Better Than Food coffee mug but you know <laughs> I screwed it up so instead of my face it's just like this out of focus blob. <laughs> Looks so stupid. I suck at this kind of thing, so if anybody has a recommendation for custom mugs other than Cafe Press, please let me know, hit me up, would really appreciate it. Always remember life is far too short to read bullshit. Good to see you guys. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and donate if you can at patreon.com forward slash books are better than food. Take care guys, I'll talk to you soon. Have a great night. Ciao.